So today, we're excited to be joined by truly uh, one of the top racers in the sport, but beyond that, just a great person, a guy that is really fun to hang out with, and, and he's, he's surprised me a couple of times, and he says things to me, and I think, wow, that is a really deep, introspective person there. You know, there's more than air between those ears. That's excellent. <laughs> And it's really great. So uh, I really look forward to this because uh, uh, I just think it's going to be a great conversation that we'll all enjoy. So without further ado, please welcome from Winfield, Tennessee, Mr. Mike Marler. So a quick background. I, I've just completed a book with Jimmy Owens, and Mike was kind enough to contribute the foreword to the book. Uh, he and Jimmy are really close friends and it was really fitting but what was fascinating is I learned a lot in the process of that about your origins and let's let's go back to that very beginning and uh, and where you were racing that night you encountered Jimmy and his guys and what an effect it had on you uh, yeah I was um, you know I was 20 years old and and uh, you know my dad my dad and I raced and uh, uh, he raced and then I kind of fell for it, you know, and got me a car and started racing, and I was in a kind of a lull, what am I going to do with my life, and I was uh, 17, 18, 19, just hanging around my local track racing, and uh, Jimmy Owens and them guys came in in their Lake Cumberland Speedway, is 1998, uh, they pulled in with our truck and trailer, and, and uh, they had a really, really cool car, I could tell these guys were really serious, and, and a really cool truck, and an old junky homemade trailer, and, and uh, so they parked next to me, and we got to talk and they started telling me who they were and where they where they raced and all the things they were doing they were traveling all around the midwest doing uh ump summer nationals type stuff and uh, modifieds modifieds yeah. i'm sorry yeah so uh so anyway uh just by chance that day i got the opportunity to drive a modified and and so we got to race against each other the first time there and and uh um he uh you know, helped me out that night, and I got a car and race, and that was the beginning of it. You know, I started traveling around and and ventured out to different tracks, and uh, but that's it's been what I don't know twenty twenty four years or something. It's been a long time. I love that story and the stories like that because if you think about it, you know what would have happened to you in your career had that chance meeting not taken place. I mean, you talked about that a little bit. It just that. The course of a person's life can change, you know, with an encounter like that, and it really changed yours. Yeah, I did. You know, I was uh, I was searching for something at that time. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, and uh, I knew that, um, um, you know, I wouldn't do anything fulfilling. You know, I was racing locally, and and uh, when I met Jimmy and them guys, it really changed directions because start going out to different tracks and had some goals. And Jimmy was the number one guy in the country. Uh, I don't know if many people know this, but one year Jimmy won 58 out of 72 races. I mean, he just dominated the sport, and uh, so uh, that was a pretty high mark to chase, you know. But uh, but I got out there, started traveling with him, and he really helped me. You know, he changed, he really sped my career up because uh, in 1998 I was racing street socks at a local track. In 2002, I was battling Jimmy for a hundred thousand dollar points battleship. You, you, did, you didn't say they were street socks. You said they were road hogs, <laughs> right? Yeah, that was, I was trying to paint a pretty picture of them. Yeah, they, they weren't really even good street socks. They were road basically just put a, uh, they pretty much just was a car with a roll cage and a stock motor. And actually, uh, the fun fact is, being that you're in a Camaro, was, uh, my dad pulled my motor out of a 68 Camaro and let me borrow it as I one of his hot rods. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, what was the biggest challenge, though, when you, you made that decision, wow, this, I want to do this. You know, I want to do what they're doing. I want to mm -hmm. travel. What was the challenge to making that happen? Well, you know, I've always, uh, you know, I've had my plans blow up in my face before. Every time you think you got a plan, God will usually change that for you. But uh, at that time, I had a five-year plan. I was, I was uh, when I was 18, I said, I'm going to give this five years. I'm going to try to race. And, uh, you know, I started off in the Road Hogs. And, well, I started off when I was 16. By the time I was 18, graduated high school, I kind of made me a little plan there. In five years, if I'm getting somewhere with this, I'll keep doing it. If not, I'll shift my focus to something else. And uh, so at the time, I, it made me a five-year plan. And, and uh, um, you know, in two years, after making up the end of that five-year plan, I met Jimmy and them guys, and, and really everything turned around. 
So what, where, was there a time, Mike, in those earliest years when you began to branch out and really had that plan? Were there nights when you said, well, two things, really. Were there nights when you said, I think I can do this? And were there nights when you said, man, I don't know? I think that uh, to answer that is um, that's something deep within. You know, you you you, you got to deep down really think you can, or it never never happens. And that's the thing in racing. Sometimes it bums me out when some guy's doing better than I am. I think he he must really want it worse than me, or it wouldn't be happening. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, but yeah, uh, there was times that it was uh, there was hard days, and there was times I didn't know what my next move was going to be, but I had faith and. It seemed like every time I would kind of come against against that wall, uh, some bear would just fall down, and somebody would come along, or so, some situation would make it better. But uh, I don't know. I never really lost faith in it. But there's definitely there was definitely hard days and, and fun days. But uh, when you when you do something you enjoy, you don't you don't ever look at the bad days. Two thousand two, UMP put up a hundred thousand dollars for the winner of the modified touring championship, the national championship. You had a great year. Jimmy had a great year. You fell just a whisker short. I have to think that that's what they call character building experiences. Reminisce about that a little bit. Yeah, it was, um, so at the time, Jimmy's, uh, Jimmy had some um, guys that went in with him on a, within a business to build chassis. And uh, so he said to him, hey, you know, I'm obviously going to drive one, but he wanted uh, Mike Marler to be the second driver. And it was, that was cool for me because I was racing an old home homemade car and it was the brake I was looking for, right? So, uh, so Jimmy, uh, Jimmy and them built me a car. I was kind of a house car driver at the time. And uh, they paid the 100000 for the points that year. And we didn't know if we could win it. We had a whole new car, a whole new everything. It was all new from the ground up. And... Uh, so, uh, yeah, he, he built the cars, and we started off the year, and everything was going good, and, and uh, come right down to the wire, and, uh, and Jimmy won. I lost by two points. Paid 100000 to win, 10000 for second. <laughs> what do they call it? Dolly Parton purse. Yeah. <laughs> she was top heavy for sure. <laughs> so, uh, so, anyway, uh, but, you know, I was – it was a – I definitely would call it character building because it was, uh, you know, at, the t at that time I think I was uh, 20, 24, and uh, that was a life-changing amount of money, especially back then. Dollar went a lot further, so uh, it was it was it was it was hard to face that, you know. That, but at the same time, you know, this guy had had helped me so much get from where I was to you know where I started to where I was, and and he was always uh, looking out for me in situations, you know. For example, one time uh, he had a he had a sponsor that was sponsoring him, and, and uh, another sponsor come along that's just that he couldn't turn down, and and he uh, he lined me up with his old sponsor and got me sponsorship on some stuff. Just one thing after another, he was helping me with, and so it was bittersweet for sure. I wanted to win, but I couldn't be no more happy for him, and and uh, and we set our goals. You know, we want to be one and two in the points, and most people thought we had a had an arrangement, you know, to split the money, but, you know, half of that money wasn't going to help either one of us, so. It, it hadn't happened yet, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's one thing, uh, we're, we're, uh, you know, racing's, uh, it's fun, but it's got some highs and lows, and that was character building, I have to say. Those years in the Modified, how, how much did that help you learn to race? What, what did that teach you? Well, you know, the biggest thing, it taught me just different tracks. We were going, uh, we were, we were, we were points racing and, you know, say if we had a competitor over in Illinois that was winning more than us or somewhere in South Carolina or wherever it was that was racking up points every week and you needed to, you needed to get more points than they did, you just had to go to that track and try to beat them, you know. So, so we would, uh, would kind of um, go to a lot of different racetracks and that was the, probably the biggest thing. And then the Modifieds were the first car. You know, when I had the street stocks, there wasn't much adjustability with them. You just got in them and drove them. And, and um, with the uh, modifieds, that was kind of the first real kind of race cars we had. So uh, learning about how to work on cars and chassis and chassis setup and all that was big. And then also at the same time, just going to different places. And I remember the the first time I went to Illinois, those guys race hard, right? And and uh, they're some of the best racers I feel like in America come out of that state. And uh, 
they uh, we they threw the green in this heat, passing points, and uh, I started middle middle pack somewhere, and I didn't know what hit me. I mean, they were slide jobs, dirt cut, spitting dirt out of my mouth. I mean, this was game on like I'd never seen before, and uh, I remember sitting on the sitting on the on the fender of my trailer after that, thinking I don't know what just happened or why I'm here, but these guys are <laughs> they're pretty serious. So. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, there was, there was times, but just going out to these different places and different styles and believe it or not, there's a lot of different styles within the, within the driving deal in, in these different areas. So what was the transition to late models? What, what led to it? Was that part of the, the original plan all along? Um, well, you know, going back to my, my five-year plan, I didn't, I didn't really have a plan of what I would be racing or anything. I just said, you know, I'm going to give this five years, and if, and if I'm getting somewhere in that five years, I'll continue, and, and if not, I won't. And uh, so, um, so at, at the end of 02, well, I guess let me go back a little bit. During that time of 2000, 01, 02, we started branching around and going to different racetracks, mostly in 02. Um, you know, I met C.J. Rayburn just because Jimmy and I would go to C.J. Rayburn's and, and use his shop to work on our car and all that. And he, um, he was really impressed that we could just travel the country, race each other every night and, you know, be buddies and civil and have a good time. So he, he, I think he enjoyed that about us. And uh, so he said to us up there in, in uh, 02, he said, you guys go do your points deal. And, and when you're done, I'm going to have your race cars ready for the Dirt Track World Championship. So that was kind of my first big break in late model racing. I had drove some late models just, you know, maybe on a Friday night somewhere somebody let me get in one and drive it and run a, run a race or something. So I had some a little bit of experience driving them, but CJ was the, the main one uh, coming into 03 that hooked us up with late models. In uh, late fall of 02, we got to run our first races and in 03 made that transition. What was the transition like? What what for you as a driver, what was the process and what did you what did you really have to work on? Well, you know, the styles have changed. Uh, now, you know, the late models are real aggressive driving. We, we go around tracks and don't really let off the gas much. And just, you know, it's really um, evolving to, you know, just driving really hard all the time. But at the time, the cars were a lot looser, slid around a lot more. So when I got into a late model after driving a modified, I, almost, I won a few races because I was the opposite of that. You know, running those modifieds, it was smooth and easy and taking care of your tires and that style of driving, and uh, so when the when you know, I think we probably surprised some people by winning some races in their early going, just based off of that. But uh, but the biggest thing was um, just the amount of work. You know, it wasn't the driving much. Is it was a late models are a whole another whole another level of dedication and work. You mean like prep the car, be ready, travel. Well, for example, when I ran a modified, we had a little piece of metal on the front for a front, and we had a hood. <laughs> and and I got that first late model, ripped the nose off of it, and 11 pieces later, I'm like, gosh, I don't know about this. This is a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you when you bend them, you got to straighten them. Oh, yeah. the late models are so much work. So yeah. so was that as you talked about your plan? I mean, did you start to see? Did it start to crystallize that this is going to be my path? I mean, this is where I'm probably going to land. Yeah, yeah, and uh, well, you know, like I said, at at, uh, at 18, I kind of formulated the plan in my mind, and that was, I guess that would be, um, I'm sorry, when I was about 20, really, is when I kind of came up with my plan, 18, 20, somewhere in there, but but anyway, uh, yeah, yeah, it was kind of falling in line, you know, because we had, we got into the late models and, and uh, was having some success. Uh, in 03, I won my first kind of touring series, you know, a little regional series deal, and and uh, I made more money with racing than I probably thought I could have working. So, uh, so I was, I was supporting myself financially. So, so I was, I was calling that, uh, that was a good enough excuse to go further. Yeah, because if you stop that, you gotta work full time at something. Yeah, when I was young, uh, you know, my dad's got a salvage yard and uh, I learned all about that early. It wasn't, the, that wasn't the, the best route uh, for me, but uh, but it was uh, you know it, it was fun. I enjoyed that too. But it's uh, it's you know it's all work. It's just what do you enjoy really? Yep, I would think that one of the key uh, developments for you, and there may have been others, but the one that really stands out in my mind is when you connect connected with Ronnie Delk. That seemed to be an impactful moment for you. Take us back to that and how it came about. 
Well, um, yeah, I had, um, you know, I'd, I'd kind of owned my own stuff for a while and then, and then had some great car owners, had a, had a, had a tragedy with one of my car owners that, you know, he had a heart attack and died and then I was back in my own stuff again. So I was having a hard time breaking that barrier, um, to get really in a good team that could travel, you know, and there was years like in 06, 07 that I was traveling around, won some races, ran summer nationals, did some stuff like that. And then, and then I was right back. In 08, 09, we had the recession, all those things. But I was uh, back 09, 08, 09, 08, 09, 010, almost racing regional and really just couldn't really come to these big races like this. So uh, when I met, uh, I met Norman Bryson, actually. Norman Norman was kind of a, a link. I don't want to leave Norman out of this because he was instrumental, you know, and very good guy. I drove for Norman uh, in Let's see, I drove for Norman at the end of 10, all of 11 and 12, and then started driving for Ronnie in 13. So so Norman really kind of gave me that platform to get noticed more and prove that I could do it. And then and then Ronnie come along, and that's been uh, an awesome relationship. We started in 2013 uh, together, and and um, it's been really good. How did Ronnie come into the picture? How What were the dynamics there? So uh, Ronnie... Um, I'd kind of heard of Ronnie's name, but but I didn't really personally know him. Uh, but I was uh, at the salvage yard one day, and and uh, a guy comes in there wanting a transmission for uh, for something he was working on, and and introduced himself, and it was Ronnie, and and uh, we started talking about racing, and and he told me that he had he had a car, him and his, a boy that worked for him was racing, and and uh, kind of doing it regionally and not real serious about it, and uh, he asked me if I'd be interested in driving for him sometime. I told him I would, and and um, yeah, just one thing led to another. He bought a car, and and uh, we went out and won the we won a ten thousand win race at Smoky Mountain, the first race in it, and uh, um, you know I guess he figured as easy as this is, we'll just keep doing it, right? <laughs> this is fish in a barrel, man. <laughs> Yeah. So, so tell me about Ronnie and you. I mean, I'm just sitting here doing some math. I mean, that's nine years you guys have raced together, and and you know, and everybody knows, this deal wears people out on each other. I mean, even mm -hmm. when they like each other, it just wears you down. But mm -hmm. what's the key? How have you guys stayed together? Well, you know, uh, I think that uh, you know relationships. You can find a uh, me and Ronnie saying to each other is people do what they want to do, really. And uh, you, know, you can find reasons to stay in them, find reasons to fall out of them. And uh, we've always just found a reason to keep going when there was a bump in the road, you know. And, and uh, But it's been a good relationship. Ronnie's a, a, he's a real faithful guy. You know, he's, got, he's a big family guy. He's really young, for most people who don't know. He's only 46. Uh, most people would think he's older than he is. And, uh, but he... Uh, He's, we've just kind of grown it together. You know, we started off with a gooseneck and a dually, and, and, and one thing with Ronnie, we had, we've always had good equipment. Even when we didn't have much good equipment, we'd have just enough good equipment to, to get the job done. So, so it's turned into a, probably one of the best relationships, you know, in my life. And, and uh, nine years together, in, especially in racing, I don't know if anybody's been together that long right now. I think we probably probably outlasted a lot of them. But... But I think some of that, Mike, is a testament to, to your, your personality, your lifestyle. I mean, you're a calm person. You, you're not prone, I don't think, mm -hmm. to a lot of this thing right here. And that's, that's what bites people, you know, when it gets way up or way down. And you, you seem to be able to avoid a lot of that. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I'm proud to say in our race team, you know, Ronnie and I have been together nine years, but Josh Davis, my uh, crew chief, heck, he's been with me since he's 14 years old. He was just a young kid around town, and now he's, I think, 31. So uh, that's what 17 years of putting up with me, so that's a lot. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, yeah, and Jerry, he's been with us for, uh, I think, seven years now. So uh, we, tr we, we definitely, you know, I don't want. I like long relationships. I don't. I don't want to have a lot of falling outs with people and, and that kind of stuff. So, uh, so uh, it's been good. You know, uh, our whole team's, you know, been around a while. It's it's not always easy. We don't we don't fight amongst each other though. It's always, you know, we try to um, look at the problem or whatever whatever we're struggling with, whether it's you know in the highs and lows of it and. And uh, we we try not to point fingers, you know. So uh, so it's been a good deal. But Ronnie Ronnie and I, the team, uh, 
been doing this for a long time now and uh can't imagine doing anything by else really you know it's just uh just fun doing it with him and and uh he's a uh he's a country guy real 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 country guy uh never misses church he, he goes to church two times on sunday and wednesday and then if they have revivals you know in the south we have a lot of revivals they call them so so he'll go to church seven days at a time sometimes and uh um he's a really hard worker uh he's kind of guy that he tells me, uh, I'll call him one day, and he'll he'll be in a business meeting with somebody. The next day, he'll be out there painting a house or something. You know, it just he he just <laughs> he says, "I'm a whatever it takes guy." You know, if I'm a, I can put on a suit and go to a meeting, or I can go paint a house today, just whatever. You know, so he's a unique guy, and and uh, he's willing to bend to do whatever. And the biggest thing is he has faith in our team. Uh, I just for example, the Dirt Million that race they had a couple years ago, we didn't know what it's gonna pay. It ended up paying Earl one at two hundred and two thousand, I think, is what it paid. And uh, I, my results had kind of trailed off a little bit at the time. I was running really good, and they just kind of fizzled out. And I'm uh, still running good, just not wins. I was running the top ten. I was out of the top five into the top ten. And uh, so Ronnie called me and said, "Hey, they got that race coming up. I got to get you a new car." And uh, you know, new cars are expensive. And uh, and and he just had faith. I know if I can get you a new car, we can win that race. And uh, we didn't. Earl won it, but I was running second and had a flat. You know about two-thirds of the way through the race so he was almost right you know so uh so he's just got a lot of faith in us and and he don't uh he don't get excited either so that's that's big you know uh you are pretty calm but i have to tell you in jimmy's book he tells a great story where he said mikey you know mikey's always level-headed and he's the guy that's calm and everything he said but then one day he said not too long ago i said i saw a video of him having a complete meltdown <laughs> i think it was florence and he says you know watching him on that video gave me joy he said it felt good it felt good to watch mikey having a moment and so so it's not always you know oh, no 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 i've um I'm I'm happy that when I was young, there wasn't so many cameras floating around for sure. So, uh, so no, we all grow up and do some stupid stuff, and I'm capable of it today, tonight, anytime. And uh, but yeah, I was really mad. I was wanting to kill a guy. And uh, um, uh, Jimmy, yeah, he told me that. He's like, I loved every second of it. I think Jimmy was standing there watching while I was running around the track trying to kill this guy. So <laughs> it was it was uh, it was it was pretty funny looking back on it, but. Yeah, it's it's true. We all have our moments, and this is a high pressure game, you know. And and uh, uh, you just watch that money go out of the checking account every ten seconds, and then the only time you ever get it back is at the pay window. So, so it's uh it's it's a high stakes poker, really. But uh, but yeah, we can we can get stupid as any of them. If you take emotion totally out of it, this wouldn't be any fun at all. Uh, and interestingly enough, on the flip side, here at Knoxville, eight years ago, whatever, 14, Jimmy had a huge spill down the front straightaway, and, and the first guy to him was you. And I don't know if you remember this, but Jimmy tells the story, he is spitting nails when he got out of the car. He was not pleased. And he comes stomping across the racetrack, and he said, Mikey, come running over, and he said, his first look was you know, I guess he's all right, he's walking, you know. But then he looked at me and said, don't do anything stupid. <laughs> so see, you're the great, you're the great influence, see, to help. But he still did, so. <laughs> yeah, he's not the best listener sometimes, but, uh, but I, I could tell he was, uh, he was really about to chew some bud and, and you know, the, the camera guys are ready. And I seen the whole deal play it out, and I'm like, this is, oh, this is gonna be bad. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so I got over. I, I hope I slowed him down just a little bit on it, but I, I didn't want him to look bad. He was, he was pretty mad. He had every right to be, but he was, he was gonna, he was gonna tear into somebody. Well, as you said, you know, this is this is a pressure cooker, and everybody boils over sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, 2018. Let's talk about that. Was a great year for you, uh, winning the World of Outlaws title. Talk about that season. I mean, was that one of those things going according to plan? When you started the season, was that the objective? Well, that that kind of um, that kind of sums up a, another kind of a life plan. You know, uh, I'd always said, uh, you know, when, through my career, I kind of had this thought in my mind. When I got forty, I would probably, you know, when you're turning forty years old, hopefully, if you live a healthy life, you 
you got a whole nother career almost after that, you know, you can do next 20, 25 years, you could do something else. And uh, so I'd kind of had that plan. I, I'm on a race till I'm about 40 years old and I'm gonna try to accomplish what I want to accomplish. And uh, so, so um, when we did the World of Outlaw deal that year, that was kind of, kind of uh, what I was wanting to do. I was wanting to win that and then just check out and do something fun after that. So what, what, was the, what was the sense when you accomplished that? Was it a, I'm curious, was it a validation type thing about, okay, this was a national title and we checked it off the list? I mean, mm -hmm. did that process that way? Yeah, it, it did. It was, uh, it was kind of a, for me, it's kind of one of them things that, that now it's on my terms. You know, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to accomplish a national title. Wanted to be maybe in the Hall of Fame someday, uh, win some big races. Eldor is something that eludes me. I, I've never been satisfied with my, how I do there. And uh, so, uh, but yeah, I just said, you know, that's one thing I could do if I haven't, if I'm a world of outlaw national champion, you know, that's, that's uh, something that's going to go down to record books and, and uh, you could feel good about your career if you could accomplish that. And uh, so we did. And, and now uh, going forward, you know, I just feel like, well, whatever else happens is, cherry on top you know but that was one something i really wanted to get off my get on my resume and and um really happy right now that dennis herb's in a position to pull it off because dennis is a guy that's worked hard been around a long time and he's uh on the verge of making it happen i think yeah their 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 work ethic he and heather it's something to admire there isn't any doubt about that mm -hmm. so let's shift a little bit and talk about knoxville i mean for any kind of car, one thing I hear a lot from people that come here is, man, this is different. This is a different kind of track and how it races and how you have to race it. Mm -hmm. But what were your first thoughts your first time here? Well, you know, the first time I came here, um, I, I drove a uh, Billy Moyer's dad's car, just drew, flew out here and drove. And uh, um, this first time I raced, it was 05. I think it was, what did it start, 04? 04 was the first late mm -hmm. model nationals, right? Yeah. So, uh, so in 05, I came out and, and, uh, it was definitely a unique racetrack for sure. And, and, uh, but I don't know, I just kind of, kind of enjoyed it. I liked how it raced and, and, uh, that particular race, I had got up to like fifth with about 30 to go. And I thought, nah, man, I really got a shot at this and had a flat. And, um, but it's, yeah, it's always been like that. It's just changed a little bit since they run the truck race here, or the, NAS the NASCAR race, it's changed the, the, the uh, the way the track races a little bit because they had to reconfigure the uh, the inner uh, access road you know so they can do their pit stops but uh, but it, it's definitely a unique track there's nothing else like it and they've even tried to duplicate it and couldn't yeah you, you, I don't it's hard to duplicate any track but especially something as unique as this when when did you start to feel like okay I'm learning some things here and I'm better than I was before and I was better even than the time before that. Well, I, I don't know if that's ever actually happened, really. I think I think I, the first time I came in here in 05, like I said, I feel like I could have won the race and, and uh, just had a flat. And then, for, for like I said, my career kind of was in a lull there for some years I didn't get to come. So, so I think the next time I came was like 11 or 12 or something, and then I uh, maybe won a 1 in 13 or 14 out here. But uh, but it's always kind of kind of worked for me. And... Uh, um, but, but you know, uh, I've never, I can't say I really feel confident because the competition level is so high. You know, the, 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 the car is so important nowadays. And uh, so as much confidence as you have in a track, if you don't get your car good, you're, you can't make it happen, you know. So uh, that's, that's, that's probably uh, the thing I worry about is the car, I guess. So when you won it the first time here, the late model nationals, was, was that a moment too? I mean, when you win something this big like this, when does it register? Is it on your cool down lap or is it three days later? What's it for you? I just think when you're, uh, from my experience in you know, being fortunate to win some of the big races that we've won is when you're standing on that stage and, and cameras are going off and it just, reality sets in, you're like, wow, we just did this, you know, and, and uh, uh, but it's, uh, it's a cool feeling, you know. When you, when you pull out of the pits, um, and headed down the road and you're looking at your work week the coming week and the race you got to go to and it, it, it's kind of in the rearview mirror but in the moment for me is this on in victory lane on the stage uh that's that's when it that's when it hits you like a ton of bricks and emotions come over you and all that so you meant you touched on eldora a second ago and said that has eluded you a little bit but this place has eluded 
a lot of really great racers, mm -hmm. not just late models, but almost anything that's ever raced here. This is a marquee place that everybody seems to want to want to win there. And then you've now put yourself in a position to win this thing more than anybody else in history. I mean, that mm -hmm. that has to run through your mind a little bit. That's got to be very satisfying. It is. Yeah, it's it's a. Uh, um if you're going to have a good track, this is an awesome one to have a good track at. And, I, and I've thought that about Jonathan and that and uh, Brandon over and a few guys that are really good at Eldora. You know, man, if you're going to have a good track, that's a good one to have. You know, so uh, so this has been a good one for me, and and uh, um, it's uh, it feels good to be in that position. And and you know, as you know, years go, you know, you, you as long as you do it, you always got a shot. I feel like, and if we get another one, you know. So just like Donnie Shots, I think he was won it so many times and he didn't win for a long time and then he come back and won one again so um it's it's a cool place it's definitely um um feels good to 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 have one of the top tracks you know in your in your resume and win some races there and, and potential be the be the all-time guy and we can't leave out jimmy owens jimmy's hot on my heels you know he was he was tore down because he didn't win that last one so he's gonna be tough you know, that's that's just it. You know, that's why we keep coming back. You know, you have three and you want four. That's that's why we do this, you know. Mm -hmm. But w when you come back here, and last night was, you know, a tough night for you. You know, you you didn't have, I'm sure, the night you wanted, but you, you, you salvaged a decent finish. And mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm looking at you, and I was worried for you in that B. Mm -hmm. You know, that yellow shuffled the deck, and you really seized the moment. But... This place is humbling in a hurry. Yeah, it is. It, this track and all of racing in general is. It's a, uh, um, you know, it's 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 everybody's so close and 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 they keep you know they've adjusted the rules in the last couple of years to really make it closer. And um, I don't know if that's good or bad. I don't know what that is even really. But but it's I know it's all close and a lot of times it boils down to the restarts and and all that stuff. The results do so. Uh, so um um yeah the other last night i that we was kind of running around the outside there wasn't really really no way to get the guys in front of me and we had that caution and it just worked out or i was i was in trouble so now i think i'm 12th in points so um probably safely in the show at 12th but today we need to do a little better and get a better starting spot for tomorrow and this has happened to me a few times out here you know uh um even last year uh we i think i can't remember what happened we got wadded up or something the first night and then came into the day two with no points so so it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a humbling sport for sure and and one day can make you or break you one restart can make you or break you there's a uh you know uh winning three of them um you know you can't you can feel like you're good there but there's a lot of things gotta line up for that to happen too so uh so it's just a. Uh, um, we do the best we can do, and uh, whatever the wherever the chips fall, you know. Well, I'm going to call on you to be a little visionary here, but people talk a lot about this, about the different things that are challenging to late model racing right now, the costs, and people talk about aero and various things that we sense that are are challenges for the sport. But you're you're living this thing, and you see you know you see how the money flows, you see how the work flows. What what's the biggest challenge for late model racing? What what are you concerned about? Um, well, economically it's tough. You know, it, it, the, our whole sport lives on the Ronnie Delks, the Donald Bratchers, the Lance Landers, is you know of the, of the of the world that they love this sport. They're just like a, just like all of us sitting in here. They they love this sport like anything, and and uh, luckily their businesses are doing good enough that they can they can own a race team. So that's that's the the lifeblood of it as far as just getting there and 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 you know and having a race and then the facilities you know uh, what's good about racing right now is all the pay per view stuff, all the live stream and that's I feel like taking our sport to a different level. I think we're even living off of that a little bit right now because the cost has went up went up a lot. So that's that's been a negative, but on the positive side, they've been able to raise the purses due to the you know all the live streaming. So so uh, we are really uh, you know and another thing too. There's so many more people watching, you know, than than ever before. Uh, uh, I go out to a restaurant nowadays, and somebody knows me that I wouldn't have thought would have known me, or or this or that, just because they're watching these races on TV so much, or so many different avenues to watch them. So I think all that's really good. Um, as far as the arrow and how the cars race, um, 
you know, I think the they're panicky with the rules right now. Uh, we got a new thing coming. You know, we're going to have a universal tire rule that's that's going to really help us, and it's not going to make it any cheaper. We're going to have I'm going to have a full rack of tires, um, no matter what, right? I'm going to have all I can put in that trailer because I do so much traveling. What's going to be awesome about it is if if we go to racetrack A and it rains out and we got to travel five hours across the track across the state to racetrack B to be able to race that night we got tires that we know can run there so many times that happens and we can't go race there because we got a trailer full of this kind of tire not that kind of tire so uh so that's going to really help us there uh, having a universal tire rule i think is going to be a good thing um but i think they're a little panicky on the rules right now they're they're really trying to contain us in a box and i don't know if it's good or not i like uh i like the ingenuity. I like, um, I'm, everybody's got a different brain. I'm more of a mechanical, you know, I grew up around the salvage yard and fixing and welding loader forks or whatever it was, you know, when I was, when I was young. So I got more of a mechanical mind. So how I make my, my car fast is in mechanics. How some other guys make their cars fast is in the shocks or in the, you know, in other things. So uh, I feel like they're taking the ingenuity out of it, which I don't, I don't like that. Well, seldom do we do things well when we're panicked. You know, being panicked is not the time to work on anything. Mm -hmm. um, what about aero? Are you concerned? I mean, just watching last night, it was startling to me a couple of times watching somebody slide up in front of somebody, and they lost the front end so bad, mm -hmm. they just went straight to the fence. And that mm -hmm. worries me. I'm, I, I don't know if I'm an old school or purist or whatever you call me, but... You know, aero has never done racing much favors in any kind of racing. And it pains me when short track guys say, oh, yeah, he was in clean air and I had no chance of catching him. Boy, that, I hate to hear that. It's, it's factual. You know, uh, my little brother is starting to race now, uh, Cameron. Most people think he's my kid, by the way. It's my baby brother. Well, you are old enough. So, <laughs> Yeah, he, he was, uh, when I was 18, he popped in the world. So I don't think that was planned. <laughs> Yeah, that's where that's where a, a husband says, "You're what?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, and he's the baby, and uh, I even treat him like my kid because when he was five, I was 23, so I was knocking his, smacking his fingers out of the light socket, you know. But uh, but he's uh, he's a great little kid. But he's he's racing now, and and uh, um, we went and tested the other day, and I put a data system on my car, and I got behind him, and and I was trying to pass him, and finally. I got ahead of him, and, and uh, it was immediately three-tenths faster as soon as I cleared him. So it's a real thing. It's a real issue. Um, it's always probably been an issue. Maybe they just didn't know it back in the day. Um, but uh, um, I think I think the cars used to slide around so much that they were always sliding. Now they're so stuck that when you get behind somebody and they take your air, it don't. So it slides or pushes or, or does whatever. But... The racing with it, I just, I just kind of attribute it. That's just part of the game, you know. That's you got to be counteractive, and you got to know how to stay out of that air, and and how to when somebody slides you to, to turn the car so you don't arrow and push the nose. So, so it's just part of the game. It don't bother me too much, but it's reality. You could wreck like really easy, especially like leaving here where the gate is, or, or over there where the gate is on the corner exit. If they slide out in front of you, you'll arrow, and uh, you could be in the wall. And I've seen it happen a couple times last night with guys. So. Uh, it's just, it's part of the game. I don't know that they could ever do anything about it, but, um, you know, it's just, uh, just the way the cars are made. You know, they've really always been that way. You know, my experience, you can change the specs, but you can't unlearn things. If people have learned what Arrow does and how to harness it, you can change the specs, but that guy still knows what he's looking for now. That's hard to, that's hard to deal with. Yeah, and that's pretty much the whole the whole planet. I mean, it ain't just racing. That's everything. We're, that's everything we do every day of the week. You know, is things just keep evolving, and we keep getting smarter and smarter and smarter on everything. And these race cars are no different. You know, we just keep learning more, applying more, and and uh, and the 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 series officials or the guys that's kind of controlling the the where the direction of the sport goes. You know, they got the best intentions. You know, they they're just trying to they're trying to make the stuff as good as they can make it, and and. Uh, but um, uh, I don't know if you can control that. I just, I just let it, let it be, and when it goes off the rails, it goes off the rails, I guess. So you, you talked about your original five-year plan. What about right now? Is there a plan? What do you look at for you and your career and, and your path? 
Well, you know, that's uh, that's kind of it's kind of the first time in my life I haven't really had it, had that. You know, I've I've, I've we me and my wife uh, we don't have kids, so our life's real simple. You know, we just we race. Uh, she she does on she's a school teacher. She's actually a civil engineer, and uh, she started teaching school so we could have the summers off and all that. Well, now they've even since the COVID even that got better. You know, because uh, 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 you know now she teaches online and uh, for a Tennessee virtual academy. So so she's down there teaching class right now in the in the race holler. And uh, so we're, we're kind of, we got some freedom, you know, to do what we want to do. And, and uh, we're just seeing how things play out right now. And, and uh, racing's been good to us. And she's enjoying her job and I'm enjoying mine. So, so we're, uh, we're cruising right now. We're trying to, trying to hang checks on the wall to race shop and, and enjoy ourselves. So that's kind of what we're doing right now. And, and uh, you know, I've got to do some NASCAR stuff and play with that a little bit. So I might do some more of that in the future. So, uh, so it's, it's been a good good uh, a good last four or five years for sure you know you talked about um you know taking care of your body so that that those years after 40 you've got some flexibility to do something else but what what would interest you if you weren't racing what kind of work would you want to do well the only i've kind of learned that the hard way almost because you know i had that plan at 40 i was gonna i was gonna quit and do something else and i looked around at different things and and got some buddies that do do interesting things so, and really nothing else interests me I, I i haven't really found that thing that i just fell in love with don't know if i ever will uh but uh but i'd probably i could consult on racing or 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 uh um you know do something there maybe but uh but I'm I'm I really like economics, <laughs> so I'm kind of a geek. Uh, so I, I like looking at the stock markets every day and and do a little trading there. So uh, so I, I like that and uh, almost think I could. I uh, I really believe I could make a living doing that. I might be stupid, but I think I could. Only one way to find out. <laughs> yep. Yeah. But it's a, it's no different racing. It's all risk. But see, that game is a lot like racing. It's so much more enjoyable if you're doing it on somebody else's money. So that, That's the truth, yeah. Maybe I'll get Ronnie to invest in that. Well, you, you're a good salesman. You, you're very, you, you have a way of winning people over. I think that's a possibility. Yeah, do, do you get tired, though, of the grind part of this, the travel? I mean... You you guys have a lot of windshield time. No way around it. You yeah. know, only for a day or two. You know, I get I, we were out two months this year, and I was um, it was going really good. So when you're out that long and things are you know we got on that that deal we had twenty two top fives in a row and and uh, you know it was just going really good every night and it's a lot easier to get up and, and forge on every day when it's like that you know but. Uh, but yeah, I get tired every now and then, but um, you know, two or three days away from it. I mean, most people, maybe they need a month, but me and Stacy, we can go on a vacation and after about three days, I'm twiddling my thumbs, thinking about how I could win the next race, you know, so so uh, so that's that's me. But um, uh, I don't know, there's just nothing else I really enjoy is like I do racing. It's, it's a challenge, it's, you know, Bloomquist said that. He's like, it's just something that you can never really conquer. And uh, we can win some races on the way, and, and big picture, feel like we made an impact, but uh, nobody's going to own it. Um, if, you, uh, if you quit tomorrow, it goes on without you. It's just something that I'm in a, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm just in it with, with, I'm just in it with everybody else in here that enjoys it and sponsors it or whatever they do. Uh, I just enjoy it a lot. So I get a little tired, but just a little, little break from it, and in uh, and, and this little, Fun fact here, uh, in it, at the beginning of uh, 19, I wasn't racing. I decided I was going to take a break from it and maybe maybe quit, maybe just not do it as much. But I went to 411. Jimmy beat him like a drum, like he always does, right? And uh, I told Francis, he was officiating for, or he was helping with Lucas at the time. I said, I'm going to go get my car. You guys ain't got enough competition. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, so anyway, uh, they, I come back and they whooped up on me pretty hard about a, for about a month for saying that. It, it is a humbling deal, you know. So you, you talked about that a little bit, about stopping. Now, there's different times you followed the Outlaws, obviously, when you won the championship in 18. But you followed Lucas sometimes and, and not for the full season. How do you decide how you're going to plan that out? What's the commitment? Well, you know, um, 
unfortunately it comes down to, to dollars and cents a lot of times. Uh, you know, the World of Outlaws told me one time, uh, Tyler that works for him said, you're the only guy that don't start the season but you finish it. And I just didn't go to Florida because it just wasn't economically good. And uh, so, so we would start, you know, messing around in maybe a start of summer racing with them and just race all the races. And, and just, I, just, I liked, I like some of the schedule they do. I really enjoy when we go to like North Dakota, South Dakota, all them tracks up in that part of the country, and Iowa, Minnesota. That's my favorite regions to race in, and uh, so we go to that a lot just because I feel like the tracks are awesome. And and uh, but um, yeah, we we you know I ran the Lucas uh, last season, and and I'd never ran Lucas before, and and. Uh, when I started it, I shouldn't have done it because I just kind of had that feeling that I just wasn't really prepared for it with, you know, that many races. And we our equipment was a little low at the time. It was really hard to get parts last year. And uh, so uh, so we finished it. And I never really started one because I didn't want to start it and not finish it. I am proud to say that the two times I've done it, we we stuck it out, went to all the races, didn't didn't quit, didn't lay down on them, and got to gotta think, you know, my guys is hard work for that. But uh, – but yeah, just some some years you're feeling it, some some you ain't, and that's how I make the decision. But I would think one of the challenges to committing like that is that, you know, it's it's this is a crazy analogy, but you like to bowl and you have fun doing it. But then you join a bowling league and they say, hey, every Wednesday night be here at seven. Well, now it's not quite so much fun. You know, now you feel like you gotta do it. Is that part of it? Yeah, not only that, when you get a pair to bowl, then you know the whole team's dependent on you and how your performance is affects everybody and, and their their result of the whole season. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot, a lot to take on there in the deal. Uh, um, I've always, uh, you know, been fortunate to kind of do do it when I want to do it and when I don't. You know, and Ronnie's been super cool about that. You know, I'll just tell him sometimes, Ronnie, we got to come home. I ain't feeling it. And when I get this, I've learned over the years uh, when I got that feeling and when I don't, and uh, when we pump the brakes, that's usually or I can just kind of see it in my team. And like I say, Josh and I have been doing it, I think, 17 years. Jerry, Jerry's been there seven. Uh, my wife's been uh, been been with me since '05. So we've we've traveled this country doing this stuff for a long time. And you you just know when you know, you know. So so it's uh, um, we're we're not afraid to pump the brakes and back up and punt. And uh, and even even. Even this year, you know, we've went at it hard. We've ran, I don't even know how many, like 80 races, 80 something races at this point. And uh, so, uh, so we're a little tired. We're probably after this, we'll go home, take us a little break, and uh, try to regroup. But, uh, but yeah, you just know when you know. But I think when you take that break and regroup, you're better coming out the other side, aren't you? I think so. Yeah, and I think that's where. Um, I mean, mentally, if nothing else. Yeah, mentally and and uh, uh, and and the car equipment wise too. You know, uh, like I say, the competition's so close. So if you've if you've kind of wore your equipment out and your car's kind of down, and your heim joints are all loose, and your 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 motor's a little tired, and rear end's got slack in it, all them things add up to a tenth or two on the racetrack, and the whole top group of guys is separated by a tenth or two. So uh, so so. Starting third, third row of a heat's nothing to be ashamed of nowadays because that's that's really no difference in time. You know, it's I mean, in a blink of an eye, you know, you could be in the middle, in front of the pack to the middle of the pack. So, uh, and everybody's so close. So, so yeah, it's it's mentally and, and equipment wise, it's good to, good to uh, good to want to go racing. Sometimes when you feel like I got to go this next and then I can go home, that's never the mindset I want to be in. You know, I want to be can't wait to get that next and I've sat around here for a day or two and I feel like I'm ready. That's that's the best mindset for us. Yeah, want to is always way better than have to in anything. Yeah, you know, when I was a kid, uh, my dad started racing, and, and uh, he was, he was, he's a really good driver. Like, he, he started racing again. We bought him a car for Christmas a couple years ago, and, and heck, he wins ever. I mean, he's probably won more than I have this year, I bet. <laughs> so, so uh, 65 years old. And, uh, but... He raced as a hobby, and uh, he could care less if he went or didn't didn't go. You know, he had a family and two businesses, and uh, it wasn't a priority for him. And uh, and I was always kind of the maybe the thing that pushed us toward going. I would make sure the car was ready, loaded on the trailer, helmet shine, whatever it was. You know, all, Dad, all you gotta do is just get in this truck where I'm ready. 
And uh, so I did that. And then when I got to be 16 years old, I really wanted to race. And I never will forget. I don't know if he was just messing with me or <laughs> really thought this, but he's like, listen, we ain't got time for you to race. I mean, I can't, you can't even get my car ready. And <laughs> so, so that that was uh, probably one, something that really drove me harder. I'm glad he had that. I don't know if he was just making me want it or what his, what his mindset on that was, but but that really really made me want to do it then you know the thought anything you know thought that you couldn't uh you know just like uh um you know in relationships whether whether wives and girlfriends it goes that way sometimes you know we they uh don't you, you take stuff for granted you know so uh so anyway we uh dad didn't let me race and uh, that made me want to more than anything and that's kind of uh, sometimes when i'm off for a month or two i want it as bad as i did then you know that's good to light that fire again like that, though. And sometimes it does take that break to, to put things in perspective. My local high school asked me to come speak. And, uh, you know, that's one of them things, like, that's a scary thing to do. And uh, so, I, But you can't not do that. I mean, it's just, it would be, um, if what I said, you know, I went there and spoke, and if I said anything that helped one person, you know, change their direction, it was worth it, you know. And, and uh but yeah, I did that, and it was actually really enjoyable, and uh, um, and I think uh, the audience seemed kind of captivated. So, so uh, I think it was successful. But yeah, I've actually thought about that when I did that that time. I thought, man, that was it was fulfilling to do that. And they say the, you know, everybody says the your the greatest service is you know service to others, and the greatest I guess joy is service to others. And uh, you might be onto something. See. Because when I grow up, I want to be just like Mikey. <laughs> <laughs> Not the version chasing that guy at Florence. I don't know. I don't know. Everybody's got to have a little color in there, man. Great question. When, when you decide to change chassis, mm -hmm. chassis, what, what's the process? Well, um, uh, so my agreement when I start driving for Ronnie is uh, I'll be the driver, you be the boss. Uh, so usually he makes that decision if we're going to go a different path. But in this sport, um, there's always somebody or some organization that wants it worse than the other ones. And uh, and we try, we've, I think Ronnie's kind of perspective on that is to try to stay, you know, like uh, right now we run Longhorn with Bill Stein. They just have a lot of energy behind them. You know, they're really working hard, testing a lot, working, working, putting a lot of effort into doing good. And as long as it's like that, I don't foresee us doing anything else. But if they get complacent and get to laying down on the job a little bit, and somebody new comes along that's that's wanting to win worse than they want to win, you know, we feel like uh, he might make that choice. But uh, but it's an interesting question, and and uh, almost every time we've ever done it has been a resurgence. And uh, just like I said earlier, you kind of, you know when you know, you know when you need to take a break, you know when things are getting stale. And, uh, and at the end of the day, you know, really we're just a customer. Uh, we buy all of our cars, buy all of our parts or whatever. So, so at the end of the day, we're just a customer. And, and uh, if uh, uh, Walmart's got a better deal than Kroger, we're going to Walmart, I guess. <laughs> yes, sir. How'd so, yeah, the number 157, how'd it come about? So my dad was he was born in 1957. So uh so his first car was number or when he started racing he was number 57 and then when I started racing I was 57 also. And so when I started running modifieds at the time there were just a bunch of cars and I went out to went out to Texas one time there was like 250 cars. El, the Eldora races would be over 200. And uh you know back then we didn't have all the cool uh, lineup boards with a computerized printout, or they text it to your phone where you're going to start in the heat or whatever. Back then, you'd have to go up there and there'd be an old chalkboard with all the numbers and, and be three or four number 57s. You'd have to put X or M or whatever on your car to identify. So I just I fixed that problem by putting, throwing a one on the front. That's really been distinctive, though. I mean, that's really part of your brand. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. And uh, um, it, so I don't know if many people know this, but in the in the racing community, three-digit number guys are usually known to be a little, a little squirrely. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I've caught a lot of slack of that. I've had to be on my best behavior because they expect me to be a little squirrely with that three-digit number. Well, you can leave them guessing. Well, I get squirrely sometimes. Droop rule. What's your opinion? So I just heard about it. Uh, they, 
they didn't exactly drop the droop rule. We we have to run a so on the chassis we were allowed to have a uh, a spring or any way we wanted to stop our movement in our car climbing. So uh, the cars kept getting climbing higher and higher and higher and being more aero, and the they they didn't like that. The officials didn't, so they wanted to contain that. So they said, well, you can have a one inch little puck in there to catch your just a rubber little puck that stopped on a chain that stops the car from climbing. And so what XR just did was they said, we're not going. What they do is they jack the car up off the ground, measured 51 inches to your spoiler. Um, XR just said. Uh, we're not going to jack the car up. We're going to check the car sitting on the ground at 40. Honestly, they really haven't changed anything. They, they, they've. I think Ricky Weiss got threw out at Eldora, and that's what brought that on. Too many guys are getting thrown out. You know, for, for, for really no. They're really not trying to cheat. All it is 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 if you put more rebound in your shock, if you change a right front spring, if you do anything to this car to make it position different. When they jack you up, it'll just squat over, and your your spoiler will be too high. So, so what they're really what I think XR is trying to do is just keep a guy from getting thrown out after he wins a race. So, the really the rule's still there. We still have to run that little puck. We all that's the same. They're just gonna measure you before a race at 40 instead of after at 51 with a car jacked up. And um, that's the only thing I hate about that rule is every time I pull up there and and you know we finish in the top you know three positions or whatever, they check our car. You're just on pins and needles, because we got a we got a hundred thousand dollar car and a twenty five dollar piece of rubber a puck that's determining our whole paycheck, and it just ain't, really ain't a good deal. And uh, and I've seen it. Dennis Herb of all people got through out. You know he's he you know he's got one person on that helps him. Him and Heather do all that work, and it's unbelievable they can even do that. And they got called on it. They they jacked up or whatever and the car was too high it seems like i can't remember the details on what happened there but but it's just uh um it was it was a bummer for ricky he went to he wanted eldora went to victory lane come off victory lane everything's good celebrating nope all that's over we're giving you check trophy money all this stuff to somebody else and and uh because of this this little puck or whatever so i think i think people are kind of getting kind of fed up with that so they're gonna probably make some changes well, Mike, it's been great. Uh, I think we're about to the end of our time here, so I really appreciate you giving us some time this morning and uh, definitely wish you the very best this weekend and the rest of the year. Well, thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. It's uh, cool to get to come up here to the Hall of Fame. Uh, uh, it's cool to just see it in general and especially to get to come up and talk with a bunch of your friends so it's been a good day you know we we were talking coming up the steps this is such a beautiful facility and you know my dream and everybody else's dream is that you know maybe someday late model racing could have something like this i mean this this to me sets the standard yeah it's really cool it's a definitely um um it's a time capsule and it celebrates all these people's lives because these guys that are in here they had a you know they give their life to this and uh and done good at it and they're in in here and getting all the cars and trophies and it's cool hopefully someday we uh we got a we got a um uh, hall of fame started now and and they're working on ours and making it better and better and um hopefully it gets to this point someday well it's been great i appreciate you doing this let's uh welcome mr mike marler for sharing our his time this morning <clears throat>